Hey, welcome to Relatable, Relationships Unfiltered. If you struggle with performance anxiety, you might feel really alone, but it's actually incredibly common. And joining me today is Cam Frazier, Australia's leading men's sex coach. We're going to chat all about where this anxiety comes from and what we can do about it. This is Relatable, Relationships Unfiltered. Cam, welcome to Relatable. Thanks for coming to hang out. No, no worries. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about this topic today of um, performance anxiety. When I create content around um, making sex better or when I'm talking with my clients about how to improve really the enjoyment of sex, I talk a lot about pleasure over performance, but a lot easier said than done, right? So when we're thinking about what we focus on in the bedroom, often it's about performance. Yes, very much so. I speak obviously with a lot of men. Uh, they reach out to me almost every single day and speak to me about you know sexual dysfunction issues. And a lot of the root causes of those sexual dysfunction issues is the underlying anxiety about performing in the bedroom and what it means to perform. So yeah, there's a lot of stress, tension, and anxiety in their body that manifests as, as other concerns down the line. And what does that usually, when, when we're thinking about performance, what is usually tied into that anxiety? Like what are some common things that you hear people talk about that creates the anxiety for them? Yeah, there's a, a script that needs to be followed for a lot of people. And that's regardless of gender, right? Like there's an expectation that sex is supposed to look a certain way, that your body is supposed to function a certain way. And if it doesn't, then something is wrong with you. And so there's these expectations that are created. And we can have a conversation about where those expectations come from. Right? Pornography is one place. Media in general is another place. Uh, social media influences is also another place, right? Like there's, there's stories and narratives that we are expected to adhere to. And then when we don't live up to that, then that can create anxiety in our body and that anxiety manifests as tension and, and so on and so forth. Um, so there's really these unrealistic expectations I feel like are one of the most common concerns for that performance anxiety. Um, one of the other things I think is also really important to like identify is like the way that sex is often framed as a performance and not as something that is, you know, focusing on pleasure, right? So the, the performance oriented approach to sex where like there's, it, it's a win lose scenario, right? Like if you don't put in a good performance, then the sex is going to be bad. And if then the sex is bad, that means that you're a bad lover. And if you're a bad lover, then no one's going to love you and you're going to be alone forever. There's a lot of catastrophizing that happens when we take this performance oriented approach to sex. And, and you know, that's when, then comparison starts to come in, right? Which feeds back into like, I've got to be having sex the way that this person is having sex because that's the expectation that's set. Or, you know, I'm comparing myself to maybe a lover's past partner and I'm not as mm -hmm. good as they are. And so there's this comparison and competition piece that comes in when we take that performance oriented approach. And all of that is, you know, amalgamated to create that anxiety around what sex is supposed to look like. Right. And then takes away so much of the fun, so much of the enjoyment, so much of just the the play aspect of it, that it is now no longer about connection or just doing it for the sake of enjoyment and now is a task. It is a chore. It is an expectation. And pretty much none of us in society need any more tasks or chores or expectations. That is like, that is what rules our world. And so this one area that we really would be a beautiful thing to just let loose and have fun and enjoy ourselves um, can be really hard to do. And I, I think that the judgment piece of it is a big part of it, of worrying how your partner is going to judge you. And then what does that mean for you, as as you said, as as a lover, as a person, as a um, you know, whatever it is, but there's that fear of then rejection and abandonment that comes along with if you're not meeting these expectations. Totally, and I think that fear of rejection, that fear of judgment, is 
Um, one of the things that hinders people from even talking about sex in the first place, right? Well, we know one of the things that's going to help alleviate that performance anxiety is opening up those conversations and being able to talk about desires and fantasies and turn ons as well as boundaries and limitations and turn offs. But the thing that's stopping a lot of people from even initiating a conversation like that is the fear of like the fear of being vulnerable, right? As Brene Brown kind of really beautifully talks about, it's like, I, I'm putting myself out there. And what if I'm not accepted by my partner? What if they reject this part of me, this this really, you know, intimate part of me, you know, um, there's, there's that fear and the anxiety around that. And I think that also leads into that performance anxiety piece as well to, to really open up and be vulnerable um, in that sexual sense as well. Um, the fear of being, being, you know, not met in that space with your partner, I think is really, um, yeah, a piece that leads to that performance puzzle. And but what I'm curious about um, as well is, you know, I, I try to help reframe uh, from performance to pleasure for my clients. I mean, mm-hmm. for anyone that'll listen to me, really. And one of the analogies that I use is rather than thinking of, uh, you know, our sex life as a sport, right, where there's like a competition piece or there's that performance piece where we can either win or lose. I talk about it being a jam sesh between two musicians. Uh, and for yeah. the life of me, I can't remember where I first heard that. That's not my original idea, I want to be clear. But I really like this idea of like two musicians coming together for a, a, you know, a, just a, a jam sesh where there's no impetus to record anything or to create really, you know, studio quality music, but just to have some fun and the play element within that. And my lovely wife is a musician, so this is like something that really lands for her. It's like just coming together and, and you know, having an having a opportunity to like feel into each other's you know, genre of music that you like to play or like how well you play your own instrument versus how well you know your partner's instrument, like feeling each other out for a moment and then playing some music that feels like enjoyable to do in the moment. So that's the analogy that I use to kind of help land the difference of approaches to sex. But I'm curious if you've got a a, a way that you help people shift from performance to pleasure. Well, so I usually dig into, and I love that analogy, by the way, and I'm just even thinking, so music is not a big thing for me, but like intellectual foreplay, as I call it is. So going to museums, going to, um, you know, look at art and then collaborating on what we're both interpreting and, you know, talking through it in that way. And that's what came to mind as you were talking through that of like, really it being more about a collaboration, like we're each bringing our strengths to it. We're each praising each other's strengths in it versus having this expectation um, you know, that you need to, uh, in your analogy, you know, that you need to play the same way that I do, um, but rather that it complements each other. And I, I love that. That's, that's a great analogy. Um, I usually dig into their beliefs around, so what is their narrative around sex and, mm. and where did that come from? And so whether it came from shame-based messages, whether it came from a lot of permissiveness, maybe they're wasn't boundaries and nobody was protecting them in childhood. And so they were overexposed early on. Um, Or as you're saying with the pornography, social media, like what is their narrative and how is it then showing up in, in the bedroom? And that is usually where I start to dig in in order to shift it. Because if you are showing up with like, um, you have to look a certain way and you have to last a certain amount of time or you have to finish in a certain amount of time or, and and, you know, all of those conflicting messages. um, I think that those narratives really get in the way of just allowing pleasure to be pleasure for the sake of pleasure, which is really hard for a lot Mm -hmm. of people. Yeah. I really appreciate that approach to looking at narratives and I can speak from personal experience here that I was very concerned with, the narratives of what sex should look like about what I should look like as a man being sexual as well. And, uh, that led to a lot of anxiety in my teenage years specifically where, um, you know, I can, I'll personally share here, like my approach to sex was quantity over quality and, uh, apologies for the, the vulgarity of the next phrase, but it's very common here in Australia as a mentality, but every hole is a goal was like the language that I would you know, use as a 17 year old boy when I thought about sex. And that was because I was adhering to these scripts or these narratives around like masculinity and what it meant to be a man. And, and you know, that was very much like, you know, you, you should always be wanting to have sex. Sex should be like, I should be the dominant and assertive person in a sexual encounter. And like, I should be the one that gives my partner orgasms. It's my responsibility and so on and so yeah. forth. And I was very 
lucky that at around the age of 19, I started to go see a narrative therapist. So someone who did narrative therapy with me. And one of the biggest takeaways from that for people that like maybe are unfamiliar was just like identifying all the stories that I've been telling myself about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a sexual man. Uh, you know, and this is, this applies generally, like, what does it mean to you to be a lover? Right. And, um, and kind of discerning, is that a healthy story? Is it actually helping me? Am I actually benefiting from adhering to that narrative or that script? And um, if I was, great. Like if it was, if it was helping my relationships and my sex life, then let's you know integrate it and, and embody it. But if it actually wasn't, uh, and, and what was the evidence for that? Like, how can I get rid of that story and recreate a new one? Like, how can I rewrite the narratives and, and adhere to some new scripts that feel more authentic and feel more genuine? And, and like I said, around the age of 19, that's when I started doing that work really, um, it really transformed my my approach to my relationships with myself, my relationships with women, and even my relationships with other men in my life. You know, I, I started in the most compassionate way possible, kind of stopped giving a fuck about their like, I guess like opinions about me because I had a lot of performance anxiety, not only in a sexual sense but also in like a peer group sense as well. I felt like I had to perform my masculinity, perform who I was as a young man among my friendship group because if i didn't then there was this anxiety related to being bullied or being caught that you know, inferior or, or being ostracized or outcast or whatever it might be so I, I think it's helpful to identify that performance anxiety isn't just exclusively something that happens in the bedroom but it's something that can happen you know uh, universally in in multiple areas of your life and, and helping kind of like learn that can be useful for like a holistic approach to working through that anxiety yeah, I love that you bring that up because that is such a good point. And the way that performance anxiety might show up, as you're saying, socially or um, career-wise, dating, like we can go on and on. The way that it shows up also impacts those environments in the same way that it impacts you in bed. So when you are so consumed by your anxiety and you're so consumed about what everybody is thinking about you and if you're good enough and um, if you are meeting all the expectations, that's really hard, A, to show up as your authentic self. And then it's also really hard to just even be present, to be just in the moment. And we see that that is some of the most common things that impact a sex life is when this anxiety becomes so consuming that, um, you know, maybe you're very limited in what you're willing to try or where you're willing to try it. Um, maybe you just want to get it over with so that like you don't have to sit in that anxiety. And I think it really takes away from the power of the connection, the power of the even the emotional intimacy that could exist. Um, if they're, you know, the, the safety was there just to be yourself and, and I would love to get your take on this. I think that both. So if we're just talking about, um, you know, two people having sex that I think both of them can have a role in creating safety for, so it, it is our responsibility to be aware of our insecurities and our anxieties and where that comes from and how it's impacting us. But I also think that a partner being able to show up as safe and reassuring and sensitive also goes a really long way in our willingness to try new things or to, um, you know, start to reduce some of that anxiety. Yeah, totally. And, and something that I often share with my clients is holding an energy of that's not a big deal. So mm -hmm. like, for example, that performance anxiety, typically is like a psychological experience, but that then manifests as a physiological experience like erection issues or um, coming quite quickly, or if it's, um, you know, for their, I work with a lot of heterosexual men, so a lot of their female partners, it might be um, maybe some dryness or some like inability to relax and surrender. And so what I'll you know, say is like, if you can hold that energy of like, hey, it's not a big deal, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, there's other things we can do. We can explore pleasure in, in other ways, like pivoting to a different type of sex act that is a bit more comfortable, that maybe doesn't involve an erect penis or penetration. Uh, so like within that, there's a conversation around diversifying your sexual experiences together. Um, that, but that like, you know, non-judgmental, kind of supportive, again, not a big deal 
energy is is at least in my experience not only personally but also professionally is like such a beautiful space to to hold for yourself and for your partner because it allows that positive momentum to keep going it doesn't like stop the sexual experience which oftentimes is, is what will happen is like oh this because we have these scripts that we follow about what sex should look like and we're anxious about those scripts if something doesn't go quote unquote to plan because our body doesn't cooperate or we you know so the anxiety kind of you know hinders from doing something then very often for a lot of couples that's like a closing down of that whole thing and because of the performance approach then sex is now a failure and so if you're able to to mitigate that from happening by going hey like it's fine. I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. This isn't throwing me off. Like I'm happy to, you know, roll the punches here and, and keep going and, and, you know, try something else. Then that very often alleviates some of that anxiety. And because that anxiety is alleviated, the, you know, Kirkman sexual quote unquote dysfunction that's kind of happening at the same time, very often if it's psychologically induced is also going to be somewhat alleviated. So that, like you, the erection comes back, the duration of sex can happen. Maybe some lubrication happens. Maybe that relaxation happens whatever it might be that's associated with that anxiety can be really alleviated with just that, that simple shift of like, Hey, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. This is fine. Let's, let's keep going and, and you know, relax into this. Yeah. And that reassurance is, is so important because even as you're describing that, I'm thinking about how common it is when maybe one partner's body is not responding in the way to demonstrate that they're aroused. And so then that creates often anxiety for the other partner because now they're in their head of why am I not arousing my partner? And so then mm. they often have a reaction to that versus for them to say to their partner and just provide reassurance in that moment, as you're saying, like, no big deal. Like, let, let's let pivot. Let's, let's just lay here and talk for a few minutes. Let's whatever the reassurance is, but taking it then back to what we were talking about with how people don't talk about sex that I, I talk about this so often because it is something I really want to get through to people. People are not talk, couples are not talking about sex. So leading up to their sexual experiences, they're often not talking about it. If they've been in a relationship for 20 years, they're often not talking about it. And so there aren't conversations around these are my insecurities and this is what I'm afraid might happen. And this is what I'm afraid that you might do if this happens. And this is what I want to be for you, but I'm afraid I can't be, you know, all of those very, as you're saying, very, very vulnerable conversations, very raw. Um, and at times can be embarrassing. That's just, they, they can be again, back to the narratives, but regardless, and because those conversations aren't happening, there is not that space prior to the sexual experience to talk through how might we handle this if it does come up or if it does come up, let me, let me make sure you know how I feel about it in advance in case it does. And how I feel about it is I don't care. I, I think you're sexy. I think you're attractive. I, we, you know, we'll do something else, but because these conversations aren't happening, there's like the proactiveness, there's not any preparation put around it. And so you're both there in the moment, completely in your own heads, completely worried about what the other one is thinking. Um, and like, not even creating um, space or opportunity for the, those moments of reassurance. Yeah, and I don't like to be dogmatic or prescriptive necessarily, but a little golden rule that I at least try and live by is don't do anything sexually that you don't already feel comfortable talking about. And mm. I feel like a lot of people are doing that, right? They're jumping into sexual situations that they actually don't even feel comfortable having a conversation about in the first place. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what are your strategies for helping couples or even just sexual partners initiate conversations? Cause there's a, there's a hurdle that I see like actually getting those conversations started. I'm, I'm wondering what yeah. your strategies are for that. Yeah, there absolutely is. So especially when I'm doing intimacy coaching, that is something that we focus on right away. We, we focus on the regular check-ins of, you know, just emotional intimacy and how are you doing? How can I show up? And then we also tie in the sexual intimacy. And what I often suggest for people to do is to purchase like an intimacy deck to find, um, I post questions on my Instagram, so I'll send them those posts. Um, but I provide them with examples and I provide them with somewhere to start because you're absolutely right. When this is not something you're used to, it feels so wildly uncomfortable. And so then what happens when we're uncomfortable? 
we make immature jokes or we laugh or we say never mind or we you know we make it so much worse than it has to be um and so i am similar in the sense that i give some guidelines around it that i say first of all find somewhere to start but an int intimacy deck to me is the best because you can just draw a card there's no like no you know no setup here we're just drawing a card you guys are both going to answer it um you're going to practice communication skills around it so rve is the tool that i use uh reflect validate and explore so that's going to go on and then i also do put some like it's fine if you laugh it's fine if you guys say like this feels awkward say it for what it is but attempt to avoid the juvenile or the immature the the junior high jokes that tend to come up in those moments because then that is just uh makes it awkward not in a good way <laughs> mm -hmm. so those yep. are some those are some of the boundaries i suggest how do you usually have them initiate it well very similar and i really uh love that approach almost like the you know gamification of initiating these conversations right like uh, i'll talk about alleviating the burden of initiation right so one of the things that i'll suggest is similarly like a deck of cards and the, the deck of cards has like a uh, almost like a would you rather game and so mm. like would you rather this or this and it gives them opportunity to have a bit of fun and playfulness with regards to the conversation because for again for a lot of couples like those conversations are like really heavy and awkward and can feel like quite uh, vulnerable and quite intense and so if we can inject a little bit of playfulness a little bit of lightheartedness it, it can help you know say lubricate the, the conversation um, the other thing that I'd like to suggest is like a yes no maybe list so just a, a long PDF of a bunch of different sexual activities and um, you know, reproductive health options and things like that. And, and you either go through it together over a glass of wine or a cup of tea and indicate, you know, if you're a yes to this activity and no, or if it's in your maybe column, if the you know, certain situations were you know, happening um, or you do it separately and then you come back and compare. Uh, there's like some, some apps, I won't mention any app names, but there's some apps out there that you can like, you know, indicate your preferences and boundaries and things like that and then your partner you know can do the same and you get matched you know with with mm. things that are that are in alignment um so it's a little bit more anonymous um there's uh, you know i'll do like intimacy dice as well like that's a fun little thing to like oh, sure. throw down and, and like there's some conversation starters there and then there's like some like yes they're like sexual activities but they're not so genital specific as well so it's a way of like incorporating a bit more touch into the the um the conversation oh oftentimes this is something that's really relevant to to men so if you're trying to get a man to open up about his like vulnerabilities and insecurities one of the things i always recommend is going and doing something physical with him so doing a physical activity with him so either going for a walk or you know uh, going on a, a bike ride where you're able to have a conversation or even just like you know this is something that comes up for me so I, i'm a soccer player so i kick a soccer ball around with my partner we go outside and we literally just stand and and you know she's uh gracious enough to kick a soccer ball around with me and and help me kind of process in that moment but it helps me get me out of my head and into my body i find that's really helpful for a lot of guys um, rather than the classic sit down across from one another at the dining room table and say we need to talk um mm -hmm. I, I recommend like chunking conversations down as well so rather than having like a if you've never done it before there's probably a lot of things you want to talk about with regards to your intimacy and sex life with your partner so you don't really know where to begin that's definitely has been true for me and it's true for a lot of the guys that i work with so it's like let's just chunk it down into a smaller bite-sized conversation about this particular thing and um and even if you're able to like you know have those conversations a little bit more frequently throughout the week rather than like late at night when you're in bed um so that they become a bit more normalized they're not just like exclusively bedroom oriented or you, yeah. know, you know sexual scenario oriented conversations if you can have it while you're you know, in line getting a coffee with your partner at the local coffee shop or while you're eating lunch together, where it's like a non-sexual situation that can help normalize those conversations and, and help them be a bit more, you know, frequent and, and accessible. And so there's a few like little suggestions in there and, and all of that helps alleviate that anxiety, which is, you know, what's going to contribute to that, you know, performance anxiety in, in the first place. Right. It's such, such good ideas. And I, I, I agree. I love how you mentioned about making it like kind of making it smaller, chunking it down. And that's usually what I suggest is either, you know, do it for maybe have conversation for a half hour of pulling cards, maybe only pull like three cards each, something like that. But I agree with that because if it feels really overwhelming, then 
it's you're going to have then anxiety about that and it's there's it is going to defeat the purpose but also what i see is that often maybe one partner wants to keep going or wants to keep talking about it and the other one does not and so then that creates even rejection around talking about it and mm -hmm. then that translates and so i often find that putting some some boundaries and some just guidelines in place can be really helpful that nobody has to feel rejected here nobody has to feel overwhelmed here um, let's just start small and and allow the snowball to grow. And I, I think that by starting with prompts is really helpful. And then the hope would be that, and especially with the Reflect, Validate, and Explore tool, that they can then dig a little bit deeper and they can, you know, get further beyond the prompt, something that is more applicable to them and to their sex life. But that is, um, you know, male clients that I work with, as you were saying, with, with that anxiety, often they will, I've heard them say that they don't want to talk about it because if they talk about it, that means that they don't know how to perform. They don't know how to please, like they should just know how to please their partner, um, without having to ask. And so there's, there's like embarrassment and shame in that. Uh, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I typically will try and reframe this for guys. So uh, a little story, I don't know if this story is true, but I'll, I'll share the story about um, supposedly it's about Frank Sinatra. So Frank Sinatra, according to this story or this legend, uh, even late into his career when he was a veteran performer and, and doing all these amazing shows, would still apparently before getting on stage, like be dry heaving and even vomiting out of like performance anxiety of getting up on stage and, and you know, performing in front of people. And when he was asked like, hey, you, you're an amazing performer, you've been doing this for so long, why do you keep doing this? I thought you wouldn't have these nerves or this anxiety about performing. And he said, I actually don't mind it because it shows that I still care about putting on a good show for my audience. And so I use that little fable, let's say, uh, to kind of like reframe for the guys that I work with that performance anxiety isn't inherently a bad thing. It means that you care about your partner. It means that you want to have a good sexual experience. It means that the desire is there to actually have this beautiful, pleasurable connection. It's just the way that it's been kind of like manifesting for you is, is what's tripping you up there. So like, there's nothing wrong with wanting to have a good, pleasurable, mutually satisfying sexual encounter with the person you're having sex with. Let's just find ways to actually make that happen and give you like that positive momentum, that beautiful snowballing effect where it, you know, you're able to, to lean into the pleasure and not the performance side of things. Um, and that comes through everything we've, we've kind of talked about. Um, so that's the first thing that I'll do is like, you know, reframe that like performance anxiety doesn't mean that you're, that anything's wrong with you or that you're bad for, for not knowing what to do. It means that, you know, there, there's a, there's a, there's a part of me that wants to like have a really beautiful time. So let, let's upskill, let's educate, let's find a way that you can make that happen regardless of what it looks like. Um, and so, yeah, one of the bane of my life, I suppose, is like getting guys to open up to me about their, uh, like, just that implicit acknowledgement. If they come and ask me a question, there is underlying that question, an acknowledgement that they don't know everything, All right? And so my whole approach is to try and help alleviate some of that, that barrier to entry for a lot of guys. And um, the non-judgmental kind of space holding is a big part of that as well. Like, there's nothing wrong with it if you don't know, like, I'll often, publicly talk about the shitty sex education that we got. Um, you know, I got yeah. hardly any, and so a lot of guys also got hardly any, and so you know, this expectation to know everything and then act, actually have no education about it is like, you know, the, the paradox of that is, is something to, to really highlight. That helps guys go, oh yeah, you're right. I, no one ever told me this, so like, why do I have to know? Um, you know I'll, I'll also, when I speak to couples, like talk to, to, talk to women, I suppose, and, and be like, hey, you, are you creating a scenario where he is expected to know everything, right? Are you even, mm. you know, are you, are you communicating with him about the things that he's doing right and the things that he's doing wrong? Um, you know, and if, if you want some um, progress to be made within that like sexual intimacy, then there has to be some openness there. Like neither of you are mind readers. So being able to like communicate a little bit more is really, really important. Um, so yeah, those are like the, the initial things that I'll do to kind of make that barrier to entry not as high Right? There's not such a wall that they have to jump over. It's kind of a, a bit more of a stepping stone that they can they can take. Yeah, yeah, and for their partner to be aware of uh, their approach to communication, their their delivery of that can also um, so you know for all genders that that goes a long way because 
Um, there are ways that we might communicate where it co is coming across as criticism, criticism, even if that's not how we intended. And uh, one of uh, one of the sex trainings, a uh, couple like sex therapy trainings that I have done, could not get that out. Um, <laughs> she talked a lot about talking about directing by what you do like versus what you don't. So instead of I don't mm -hmm. like it when you go right, talk about I like it when you go left. And I think that that is just such an incredible tool that when we can even reframe our feedback and reframe our communication, that we're focusing on the strengths and the things that we do like, the things that we do enjoy, naturally your partner is going to do more of that. Like you don't even have to say, you know, necessarily stop doing X, Y, and Z. A lot of times it's, I really like A, B, and C. Your partner, again, because they care, and that's where this anxiety is coming from, they're going to be all over A, B, and C if they know that that's what you like. Um, so the communication is so important, but not just communicating, but also how you're communicating makes a big difference when it comes to the anxiety. Totally. I, I like to say keep it pleasure oriented and positively framed. So you know, yeah. if you even if you want to have a conversation with your partner about sexual intimacy, like the pre-framing of that conversation could be something to the effect of like, hey, I really enjoy having sex with you I, I, and I want to have more sex and I want to, uh, sex to be better. I want to explore more pleasure with you. I'd love to have a chat with you about that rather than being like, we need to have a talk. Uh, there's something wrong with our sex life, right? You know, yeah. There's, there's <laughs> you know, those going to be received very differently if you're bringing that to, to your partner. So um, I 100% agree with that whole idea of yeah, focusing on what it is that you that you do want. And like, of course, if your partner isn't, responding to that and, and isn't doing those things, then there's another issue, right? There's something else to, to talk about there. Of and course. also I want to throw in the caveat of like, if something is hurting you and your partner is doing that, please speak up, please say, stop doing that. Absolutely. No. And that is a great point. And I've had plenty of couples where, uh, somebody might be insisting on, you know, something the other person has set a boundary around. Um, and that's absolutely not what I mean. I'm certainly talking about more when it's uh pleasure based and things you both have agreed to but great point and thank you for bringing that up when you are moving it from conversation to the bedroom and uh, i guess let me give you some context for this so when i'm helping a couple either to revive intimacy or to improve intimacy whatever that looks like uh, or help with the perf perf performance anxiety we start with the conversations and really focus on let's get comfortable talking about it. Let's just get it out, what we like, what we want. Um, but then I do have some different uh, exercises, I guess, that they start doing in bed or start doing leading into the sexual intimacy to help to alleviate it. So again, same idea, the snowball effect, we're gonna start small and grow on that. What is your approach to that when it comes to like, okay, we, we know we want improvements here. Um, we've talked about it. We know what you both want. Now what? Mm, yeah, I typically take a uh, approach that de-centers the penis just because of the nature of the work that I do. 100% of my clients have a penis, so the sex is gonna involve that. So I'll, I'll talk about this idea of phallocentrism, which is like sex revolving around what the penis does or doesn't do. And mm -hmm. uh, so, what invitation I'll give them is to maybe take genital stimulation or even penetration off the table for a little bit, you know, temporarily. And um, if that's off the table, what else is on the table, right? It's the kind of implicit question within that. And so that leads to a conversation or some brainstorming around like, all right, well, let's think about some other types of touch. Maybe it's a sexy massage. Maybe it's using some toys. Maybe it's using your, your, fingers or your tongue or your toes or whatever other part of your body you and your partner are interested in. And within that, there's like some little activities and some games that we can, we can kind of like inject into that scenario. Um, so like you know, decentering the penis is one. Uh, another thing that I'll often talk about in those like more sexually explicit containers is um, like there's a practice called pleasure mapping. And so for those that are unfamiliar, it's like, this idea, as the name suggests, of just like mapping pleasure across your body, starting at the tip of your toes and working your way up to the crown of your head and just collecting information, collecting data about your partner's body and what it is that they enjoy and what it is that they don't particularly enjoy. And when I frame it as like an experiment or as something that is 
just information gathering, that takes a little bit of the ego out of it, a little bit of the personal uh, story out of it. So there's not a lot of anxiety around it for, for the couples that I work with where that's a, an activity I've given them. And it's really helpful for learning my partner really likes it when I squeeze their thighs like that. Or my partner really likes it when I trace my fingers across their chest. Or my partner really likes, or, my, or, or, or conversely, my partner doesn't like it when I uh, scratch their shoulders. Or my partner doesn't like it when I'm squeezing their hips quite firmly. You know, there's so many things that you can glean about your partner's experience of pleasure that this practice gives you. And then you swap, right? You take turns and, and you allow your partner to you know, touch you in a bunch of novel ways, starting from the toes and working the way up to the, to the head and feed that information back to them. So there's this like really beautiful learning experience that, that couples can have. And because there's no expectation that this is supposed to lead to sex, that it's not foreplay and which comes before penetration, it's, it's an activity that we're doing to just learn about one another and to have that curiosity and that playfulness and that inquisitiveness about our partner's bodies and, and how we can take that on board. For when we do have sex, what do we know about our partner? We know that they really enjoy that type of touch. Maybe I can incorporate a little bit of that when we're being sexual. When my partner doesn't like that particular type of touch, I'll make sure not to do that when I'm with them um, and vice versa. So yeah, again, I love the idea of bringing little activities and games and things that are going to inject some playfulness, inject some, some lightheartedness, um, because I think that's helpful for alleviating stories, narratives, taking the ego out of it and, and minimizing the amount of anxiety that they feel. Agreed. And the taking the sex just off the table completely is also my approach for often um, a while that I, and I think part of that is that it creates like, we want the forbidden fruit, right? So it does create also some tension building for them and some playfulness, even in that, that if, if we're being told we can't do this, then it, it just creates a different mindset around it. But I also think that it, it takes away a lot of the anxiety when, as you were saying, there's not the expectation it's going to end in sex. Like it's not, we're, it's not, we're not even taking it there. And so we don't have to be as worried about that. What you're talking about with the pleasure mapping is a brilliant idea because then that becomes about what they're, it becomes about their partner and not about them. So it becomes like, this is just what your partner likes, regardless of who they're with, regardless of, um, you know, any of that context, it's what they personally like. And I think that a lot, I mean, of course, we take into our present day sexual relationships, what we've learned in our past ones. And so what our partners in previous relationships have taught us that they like, or they enjoy, or that is good to them, we naturally take with us because we just take it as like, well, that must be what, you know, a partner wants. Um, but when you do something like the pleasure mapping, now it's less about, okay, am I good enough at this thing that people want? It's now, let me show up in the way that you need. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that stokes conversation as well, right? Like it's, yeah. it, it, it's a two-way street, right? And being able to have those conversations then makes the sexual practices a little bit easier. And then when you start to do the sexual practices and you start to learn more, that feeds into a conversation about the sexual practices, which makes the conversations easier. And it becomes this beautiful um, kind of symbiotic relationship. And one thing I want to add to that, I suppose, is like, if you're wanting to have those conversations, start doing those activities, one of the things that can be scary is bringing that to the table, right? And saying like, hey, I you know, want to do this thing with you. Again, that's a very vulnerable thing to, to say to a partner, mm -hmm. uh, the fear of rejection and all the things we identified before. So something that can be useful is listening to a podcast together or reading a book together or watching a TV show together. There's some great shows on Netflix now that are centering, you know, sexual experiences and, and you know, have a sex and pleasure positive kind of lens applied to them. So being able to, again, alleviate that burden of initiation by going and outsourcing that to a game or a podcast or a you know, social media influencer, again, being mindful of the narratives that they might be perpetuating can be helpful for stoking conversations and, um, you know, inspiring some creativity in the conversational and also sexual sense. And so I think that's something I wanted to add in there as well. It's like, there's so many ways that you can start to inject a little bit of that 
sexual element into the relationship in a way that maybe doesn't feel as scary to do if it was just you saying, hey, we need to have this conversation about this thing. Right, which is so funny because that's exactly what I had told Melissa, our producer, before we started. I said, um, I, I hope this can be a conversation that somebody would want to then send to their partner to really initiate that that kind of conversation. And I agree, it can take some of that pressure off when it's like, hey, I, I listened to this, I found it interesting. Would you listen and then can we chat about it is way different than just out of nowhere bringing up like, yo, we need to improve our sex life because <laughs> it's it's not what I want it to be. Uh, is, yeah, sounds way different. And the, um, I, th I, don't, I don't know if it's on Hulu or on Netflix, but Goop, the Gwyneth Paltrow um, Goop one, did you watch that? Yeah, I'm familiar with it, yep. Yeah, the, I think that was a really good one. I, I recommended that to a few of my clients. I thought that was good to open up conversation because they were really working with a lot of couples who are struggling with their intimacy. Totally. And I think engaging with material like that and like this podcast and other resources is that you realize you're not alone. I think that's part of where a lot of performance anxiety comes from as well as this sense of like, I'm broken because I'm not following this particular expectation or I can't live up to that expectation and kind of realizing well, those expectations are unrealistic in the first place. And there's so many other people that are having a very similar experience, that sense of solidarity and like, oh, this is a normal thing. And like, we don't get the education that we need and we are approaching sex from a kind of skewed perspective can be really helpful to know that there are other people out there feeling very similar. Um, so I think just by virtue of engaging with content like that, and the same thing goes for like social media, something that I'll recommend to some of my clients is um, starting to follow sex positive, pleasure positive people on social media uh, who are maybe telling a, a, a better story or a more um, appropriate story for them when it comes to like the way that they should show up as a man or the way that they should show up as lovers. and. Um, so I think curating social media feeds as well can be a helpful strategy for helping you write new narratives, right? And, and adhere to new scripts and, and even just be exposed to alternative ways of thinking about sex and pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. And finding those social media accounts that, that normalize and that bring the humanness to it instead of just all the shoulds and the expectations, but rather you know, this is, this is the human experience. And I think a lot of people get surprised with how insecure and anxious so many of us are um, when it comes to a lot of things, but especially our sex lives. So the normalizing it is so important. You do such a good job of that on your social media. And oh, um, I really appreciate all of the videos that you do that are so informative and so normalizing. Um, and just like, I, yeah, I guess informative is the best way to put it. It's stuff that the everyday person does not know. And so it's probably in their head about or embarrassed to ask embarrassed to seek out. And um, I really appreciate how you are providing that to the social media community. So thank you for that. That's really lovely. I, I sometimes forget that people are watching all my stuff. And so <laughs> um, I appreciate the feedback. It's really lovely. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So tell us, Cam, where can people find you? What are, as we're talking about your social media account, um, your website, socials, what is all of that info? Yeah, uh, so I'm uh, on all social media platforms at the Cam Fraser, and that's F R A S E R for all my American listeners. Um, sometimes they get my name wrong, and that's fine. And uh, my website is cam fraser.com. And yeah, I try to be as educational and as informative as possible on there. So I guarantee that if you jump on there, you'll learn something new. And I would be the American that got your last name wrong. So I apologize. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> good to know. I uh, will be aware of that. Well, thank, thank you, you again for coming to hang out. This was very informative, very helpful, and I appreciate your time. No, no worries at all. I've been, uh, yeah, been having a really good time chatting to you, so I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. Thanks again, Cam. It has been a pleasure. And thank you all for hanging out on Relatable Relationships Unfiltered. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, sign up for my newsletter, and find me on Instagram at Dr. Elizabeth Bedrick. This is Relatable, Relationships Unfiltered.